University of Copenhagen, in addition to myself, the three of us have been working for the past six years or seven years on using 50 centimeter satellite data in large volumes to map trees at the tree level. And most recently, we have converted them into carbon over an area of 10 million square kilometers from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. I will also review that. So uh, Martin Brandt and Anket and myself use the phrase hyperspectral uh, remote sensing to, to introduce the topic. That's because we're using um, submeter satellite data. I'll show you several examples of 50 centimeter satellite data. And when you use, use large volumes of commercial satellite data, the satellite data, which I'll show today, largely come from, from Maxar, uh, which we're able to use under the next year license. But if you use hyperspatial satellite data, you need high performance computing. And this leads into machine learning. And so these three components, the satellite data, high performance computing and machine learning make for a very powerful combination. And as you can guess, in something as complicated and many faceted as what I'll be discussing, we have many wonderful colleagues with whom we work. So we're gonna have the next slide. Um, one of my colleagues is Matthew Hansen uh, at the University of Maryland, and Matt Hansen and his group have been producing global 30 meter maps of, of forest cover change using Landsat data. Uh, this is one of Matt Hansen's and his group's figures where they have mapped satellite data or satellite data forests around the world. This is very seminal work. It's global in scope. And um, Martin Brandt and I decided we would attempt to work in the semi-arid area because heretofore no, no one has been able to work there. So if we have the next slide. So uh, a year and a half ago, uh, a whole bunch of us, as you see on the right, published a paper in Nature. Uh, where we mapped 10 billion trees and converted them into carbon in the semi-arid zone from, uh, from 24 degrees north down to the 1,000 millimeter ISO height for precipitation. Uh, and we focused upon the arid zone, the semi-arid zone, the Sudanian zone, and the subhuman zone as you go all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea. And in this study, um, for our total area, we went from nine and a half degrees north to 24 north. We mapped 13 billion trees. If you only go down to the 1,000 millimeter per year ISO line, for that area, we mapped 10 billion trees. Um, for the total area, we also mapped 3 billion bushes. Um, and uh, you see at the bottom part of this figure uh, a blow up of, of many of the, or a few, very few of the trees which we mapped. So this was a subcontinental scale study using machine learning, high performance computing. For the study we published in Nature, we burned uh, in excess, just on that paper, 50 million core hours on Blue Waters, a 13 petaflop machine at the University of Illinois. Um, next slide. So why do we map individual trees? Well, the first reason is that no one had been, has been successful to map them at large scales heretofore. Um, and we were able to do this using the three elements of hyperspatial remote sensing, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. So here's just an example, looking at Landsat data on the bottom left. And then on the bottom right, you see a blow up where you look at the gridded 30 meter 
spatial resolution grids, and you see all the trees which fall within it, which would be overwhelmed by non-tree background in Landsat data and also in Sentinel-2 data. Um, so this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to work at finer and finer spatial scales, scales to inventory and map accurately trees which heretofore have not been mapped by any remote sensing satellite comprehensively. Next slide. So this is how we define a tree. For our study, it has to have a crown, a green crown area for which we use the NDVI. And if you look at the figure on the left and in the, in the green areas, each one of those rectangles is a 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter pixel. So here we've mapped a tree which has a uh, crown diameter of 4.3 meters. In order to be a tree, it has to have a green crown and it has to have an associated shadow in the direction away from the incoming solar flux. If it's green and doesn't have an associated shadow, we call those bushes. And for the most part, they are. Now, we mapped 3 billion bushes, but we have done nothing with the bush data yet. But uh, some of us, I think, shortly will start to look at the bush data and see what we can pull out of those data. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Now, uh, here, again, illustrates on the left-hand side the NDVI pixels of a tree which has a crown area of nine square meters on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you see a panchromatic image with the NDVI outline of the detected tree crown and the associated shadow at the top. So therefore, we would map this as a tree. If it doesn't have a shadow, we, we do not call it a tree and we don't inventory it. Um, next slide. Now, people say, well, could we use planet data for this? Well, you could, but you would miss a hell of a lot of trees in the semi-arid area. Uh, on, on the left-hand side is our referenced tree with a crown area of nine square meters with a crown diameter of 3.4 meters. Well, the planet's spatial resolution is on the order of three to four meters. So depending upon where the pixel falls, you will miss a lot of trees. Let's go to the next slide. Now, what about Sentinel-2? Well, I am a huge fan of Sentinel-2 and the Sentinel-2 Landsat harmonized data for time series purposes. But the Sentinel-2 data are 10 meter data. And you see here in the upper left-hand corner is a panchromatic image of three trees. And then we go in the upper right-hand corner where we have the NDVI superimposed upon it. And we see a tree which has the number 219 in the center of the upper right hand corner of that image. And that is an individual tree. And that tree has uh, a crown area of 219 square meters and a diameter of 17 meters. And then we have planet data in the lower left hand corner superimposed upon those trees or that tree. And then on the right hand side as well, we have the Sentinel-2 data. So even with the Sentinel-2 10 meter data, you have difficulty working on discrete trees. Um, you pick up the larger ones, but that's never been a problem. But you simply miss a huge number of trees, and a huge number of trees in the semi-arid region means a lot of carbon. Next slide. Now, this is an interesting image. We've spent a lot of time um, studying the accuracy of what we do. So here's a photograph which Martin Brandt took of the tree in the upper left-hand corner with that red arrow pointing to it. And on the right-hand side uh, of the image uh, beneath the caption is an arrow pointing to the same tree. Now you'll notice there are a lot of features in the left-hand, upper left-hand corner image, which are tussocks of grass. And we do not identify any of those as being trees. So we feel we have a very accurate 
tree crown mapping and tree identification uh, approach, which we describe in our proof of concept paper in Nature, first author Martin Brandt in 2020, and then our follow-on paper uh, in 2023, where I'm the first author and Martin Brandt is the second author. Uh, so this is what we do, and we spend a lot of time determining what our uncertainties are. Next slide. So to recap, we're interested in mapping individual trees and savannas or places where you have discrete trees. Uh, it could be some of the dry areas of Arizona and New Mexico. I'm from New Mexico, and I know there are many dry forest areas <clears throat> where you have pinyon pine and juniper, which are separated from other trees. They are not growing overwhelmingly in contiguous clumps. So there's a ground shot of a study area, which we have in, in North Senegal. The middle image is the high resolution Maxar satellite panchromatic view. And on the right hand side is the same image, which we have mapped by deep learning using NDVI and the shadow to identify trees and determine the crown area. So the next question is, well, how accurately do we map crown area? So let's look at the next slide. One of the things many people have said to us, well, why don't you base your, your training data on, on, on areas where people have tree plots? Well, if you don't accurately map the shape of tree crowns, you can introduce up to 15 or 16% additional error as you see here. So here, what we have done is, uh, is, is we've come in and we have drawn various circles or, or ellipses with a long axis and a, and a short axis. And all of these areas have, or all of these sub figures have the same area. But the overlapping area with whatever feature is drawn can vary from that by up to 16%. So this is why we feel if you're going to use plot data, you have to be really, really careful what you're measuring and how you measure it in terms of tree crowns. Next slide. Now, because we use machine learning, we all know learning are your training data. So for our proof of concept paper, which was Brent et al. 2020 in nature, uh, and also for the Tucker et al. paper in 2023, for the, for the tree carbon paper, we use the same training data. And they were training data personally selected by Martin Brandt, who selected almost 90,000 individual trees, which we use for our training data. Now, when we started our work going, so our proof of concept paper only dealt with this area, which you see here. You see all of our work ends at 1,000 millimeters per year on the right-hand side. That's because that's on the boundary we use for the, uh, between the subhuman zone and the more human zone. And that's also the area where you have most of your trees being discrete and not contiguous. So when we started to work uh, on, our, on going from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea, all across Africa to the west, uh, to the east from the west, we uh, thought we'll have to add training data. But because the species are the same from the Atlantic Ocean to the Red Sea, we were surprised we did not have to add any training data. And so we didn't. So these are the training data which we have used for both of our nature papers in 2020 and 2023. Next slide. Okay, so for our proof of concept paper, uh, we went into a lot of detail in that paper about many of our data organization and other computational aspects of the work, which we use the very same ones for our 2023 paper. But uh, for our proof of concept paper, we only use 50,000 digital, digital globe multispectral images. Uh, they were from four digital globe satellites. Um, and we emphasize having data 
from November to March, with November being the best month and then followed next by December and next by January. Um, we, ortho we ortho rectified everything to a common mapping basis, which you have to do. And then we pan sharpened all the multispectral bands. And then we produced the NDVI and we, and we also had the, the pan band. And our priority was to use images from in the early dry season uh, and with an alternator angle uh, of less than 25 degrees. And we largely succeeded. Next slide. Okay, now when you use a multitude of images, uh, you're going to have variation in different images and also large variation in background characteristics. And so we, we use the data as they are. We have areas which are burned and we have areas which are cloudy and areas which are aerosol affected. And I'll show some slides of those areas. Uh, and in some places, a small number of our tree canopies, a fraction of 1%, uh, have trees growing together so their canopies are merged. What we do in those cases is we disaggregate them into smaller trees because our llama tree breaks down for tree canopies over a certain size. Uh, and in, in addition, you'll have differences in phenology due to season and annual variations. So those are the challenges which we faced. Next slide. So this is from our, our nature paper of a year and a half ago. Uh, and we produced 10 billion trees and converted them into carbon. So we said, wow. How are, we, how are we going to escape from this box we put ourselves into with 10 billion trees? How are we or anyone else going to be able to use those data? So kind of like the famous magician Houdini, we had two people, Paul Morin and Sean Loeffler, who said, we will write a viewer. And it's based on Mapbox. And so superimposed on Mapbox, uh, our so sample outputs from our viewer. All the green blobs are trees which we mapped. And because everything is ortho rectified, they match up very well with the map box data. And so here you can see what the context of the topography is where we have mapped trees. You can click on any one of the trees and it tells you what the what the crown area is, what the NDVI was. Uh, it tells you the coordinates and it tells you the leaf, wood, and root carbon and total carbon. And it also provides a link back to the digital globe image, which was used for that particular portion of what we studied. Now, on this small area, we use data from two different satellites. Um, on, on the left-hand side, a satellite image from the 8th of December of 2016. And on the left-hand side, an image from the 28th of December, 2014. When you use data, uh, which you didn't buy, you, have, you uh, end up with situations like this. If we, if we would have had three or $400 million to buy data, we, we, we could have, but we would never do that. Uh, but because these data had previously been purchased by entities in the US government, we were able to get them for free. Um, so, this is, so this is our viewer. If you want to see how it works, go to the methods section uh, under data availability at the end of the method, method section in our most recent nature paper. And there'll be a link to the viewer which also enables you. So you see here, there are two trees. Uh, one, you can't see where the tree is because it's, uh, uh, it's blocked by some uh, network, something or other. Anyway, so this is what the viewer does. It, it, it proved invaluable for us for checking things, but it also makes it uh, possible for people to use the data 
And let's go to the next slide. Okay, now all of us, I suspect, are somewhat familiar or more with, with UNET convolutional neural network analyses. So you take images and you go through them uh, in, in different batches and different spatial resolutions, and, and the UNET is very good at detecting boundaries. And when you do this for trees, you detect the boundaries of the trees. So this is just an example. I believe this, when well, you see the reference here, it's from Persley uh, 2019 and Coke uh, and Isser from 2019. So the, the UNET architecture was developed to work on, on uh, for biomedical purposes, to scan large numbers of stained tissue samples to identify abnormal cells. So Ankit Kararia has taken that and modified it for our use with trees. Next slide. So this is just another uh, illustration of some of the things you do with convolution, uh, but you do this, this is, convolution is, uh, or UNET convolution is matrix algebra enabled by high performance computing because you burn a lot of computer time implementing all the steps. Next slide. Here's the slide again. Let's go to the next one. Okay, so this is a summary of what we did. Uh, the editor of Nature uh, called me and said, Tucker, you're going to have to have some sort of overall figure or roadmap so we can see uh, what you did and how you did it. So starting in the upper left-hand corner, we used a third of a million uh, commercial satellite Maxar images uh, at the 50 centimeter level. Uh, we ortho rectified everything. Uh, then you go across the top, then there's mosaic formation. We processed all of the Maxar data and preferentially selected them by um, off or angle, uh, Summer zenith uh, with a strong preference to the early dry season, and then produce the panchromatic and NDVI images, which conform to the images selected. And then that resulted in we used uh, 94,500 Maxar images. But they were formed into mosaics to eliminate the possibility of multiplicative counting. These were data at 50 centimeters, and then people are astounded. This resulted in, in an array, which we had to process, of 40 times 10 to the 12th, or 40 trillion array elements. And if we hadn't had blue waters uh, to burn the 50 or 60 uh, million core hours we needed to process the data, we never would have finished this. Okay, then we drop down in the middle. We see there's the convolutional neural net code. It's UNET architecture. And, and, and machine learning, the hyperparameters are really, really, really important. So we had no dropout, batch normalization, turf speed loss, upsampling, pixel wise weight maps for clump trees, and several other aspects. Those are all detailed in our proof of concept. So then we optimized our code. I have one programmer that can rewrite the code to match the architecture of the machine it's running on. If you have, if you're going to burn a huge amount of high performance computing time, any optimization, however small, will save you a lot of time. Then Martin Brett had the training data. And so we incorporated that. We had high performance computing on blue waters and we mapped 10 billion individual tree grounds. So let's go to the next slide. So one of the first things we did uh, is it's, it's uh, any study like this, you get hammered to identify what your uncertainty is. As we all know, for something like this, you can run off and do things and think I did a really great job, but you need to establish that because you can easily make a, a, a huge mistake uh, hundreds of millions of times. So uh, we came in and we hand annotated the crown area 
of just under 6,000 trees. And we found there was, a, there was an error of 2.5% in area. So you see the trees in green as they are in satellite images, and the, and the area around them in red, the, the line around each of the green blobs, that is what the analyst said was the true crown uh, shape. So we have a two and a half percent here. Let's go to the next slide. Then you also have to worry about errors of omission and commission. So omission are errors when you miss a tree, and commission are errors when you say it's a tree and it's not. So this is the summary. So we had a total of, we, we sampled just over 50,000 trees and how we mapped them. And we had omission errors of 4.9% and our commission errors of 4.9%, omission errors of 2.7%. And, and so therefore the net omission commission error was 2.2%. Next slide. Now, this is what you do. Uh, as the first author, I took part in all phases of this paper. Uh, I didn't optimize the code to run on the architecture of Blue Waters. That was way, way beyond my uh, ever so quickly languishing um, coding skills, but this, you would have images like this. So in, in, in this image, uh, all of the green trees represent a different size. All of the blue uh, trees represent a smaller size and the yellow are smaller still. There's a, there is an image or there's a scale in the upper left-hand corner so this is an image I analyzed for omission and commission errors. And the only error I found in the lower right-hand corner, uh, no, in the lower left-hand corner was one omitted tree. So therefore the score for this one was 67 trees were identified and there was one omission error. Now, when you work with satellite data, sometimes and, and you go through image after image, you get kind of bored. So I turned this into my 2021 Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's, winter solstice card. So go to the next slide. So uh, when you work with, with colorful images, keep in mind you might be able to use them for all sorts of things. Uh, so, so this was my 2021 uh, uh, holiday season uh, Christmas, Hanukkah, and of course a good solstice and best wishes for the next year card. Next slide. Now, one of the things you have to deal with when you use satellite data is maybe there have been fires in the area where you work. We were very, very concerned that maybe all of our mapping would go to hell if we were if we were mapping trees over burn scars. This is another image I worked on. So uh, here, uh, let's see, there were only, I'm looking for the final, so the score was there were four errors out of 150 trees mapped in terms of omission or commission. And one of the errors uh, on the right-hand side, it looks like a, a wedge of cheese enabled, and it's labeled W1. That was some weird error in the data processing. So then there were there were uh, there were three. Uh, let's see, there were three trees which were not mapped, and then there's the weird image which looks like a slice of cheese. What we found when we when I spent more time on this, I realized that in savannah systems, so this is a tree savanna, fire is a very frequent uh, occurrence there, and most of the trees are adapted to withstand fire. And so what this did was it, it was it, it, it came in and it isolated the trees and removed any possible uh, confusion from herbaceous vegetation or grasses. So, so burn scars, uh, at least the ones we looked at, which didn't kill any trees, uh, actually proved very useful to us. 
Next slide. So our total errors, we had omission and commission errors at the top. We had area and crown determination errors. So our, our total crown error was plus or minus 3.3%. The editor in nature uh, sternly or very politely because uh, she's a fantastic editor, a, a Julianne Mossinger, told me that we needed to improve our uncertainty analysis. And so we did. So we had the small error plus or minus 3.3% in terms of the crown area from omission to commission errors and the area of the crown errors. Uh, and most of our errors came from our allometry, which we used to convert crown area into leaf carbon, wood carbon, and root carbon. Now, in a subsequent Monte Carlo method, which we developed but didn't use, we take into account covariation of some of the uncertainty. And covariation of some of the terms in an uncertainty analysis is lower. So therefore, we feel that our, our 2023 nature uncertainty was conservative for that reason. Next slide. But this is something you have to do. If you're going to work at these scales, you need methods where you can express your uncertainty. So, so we use allometry where people go out and cut down trees and measure the crown area. They measure, uh, they strip off the leaves and dry them. They take all the branches and uh, trunk of the tree and dry that and weigh that. And then in a few cases, they go and they dig the roots. So this is really laborious work. And this is the source of all of our uncertainty. But because you have the same species of trees from the Atlantic Ocean over to the Red Sea with respect to precipitation, that was not a problem for us. We assumed it would be, but it turned out that it wasn't. So this is what the data looked like. Wood is on the left. In the middle, and B are roots. And on the, on the right-hand side, uh, those are the foliage data. So for foliage data, we have 900 trees. For the root data, we only had 26 trees. And for the wood, we had uh, 600 trees. So those are the scales of the data we had to work with. Next slide. So this is what the heroic tree, tree people would do and go out and they, and they collect root mass. So on the left-hand side, you see that they have cut down a tree and they lay it on a tarp to strip the leaves off. They then continue, continue digging down in the pit because this tree has a big taproot. And then you see they finally get the last of the taproot out. Laborious, laborious work. Next slide. So then we ended up having carbon stocks at, at the tree level. We could then allocate, allocate uh, all, all the tree carbon to the hectare scale. And so these are some examples. So on the left-hand side, the top panel, uh, which is below carbon density is aggregated tree level. We have all the tree grounds we map. Then below that, we have the, um, we have superimposed all of the trees in a color-coded fashion by crown area class, the carbon and the trees. And then below that, we have the carbon per hectare. And then below that, we have everything together. So all of these data are available at the Oak Ridge National DAC, uh, depending upon what you're at, after trying to get for any set or subset of our data. Then you see everything together on the right hand side. So let's go to the next slide and we'll show you what else we can do. So for some areas, we had repeat images. So here's an area in Senegal, northern Senegal, Kambili where we mapped the area. And in 2002, we had uh, six, six milligrams, no, six megagrams of carbon per hectare. And then uh, in uh, 2021, that had increased for the same area up to 10 megagrams of carbon per hectare. So in some areas, you can look and see if carbon restoration has, has worked. Next slide, please. 
okay, now we weren't content to stop there, but uh, uh, several of us led by Martin Brandt and one of his uh, postdocs, Maurice from Rwanda, uh, used Swedish aerial blue, green, red aerial photography to, to and then with associated training data. Uh, these were data at the, uh, uh, I think at the 25 centimeter level. They, no, yes, the 25 centimeter level. And then they used our same technique. They used different training data, of course, because this was for Rwanda. And they were able to map uh, and quantify the carbon in trees in Rwanda doing this. Next slide. Now we're really interested to move into areas of contiguous forest because they're very interesting. And so I'll show you some examples of our progress to date there. So uh, based on extensive training data, we can map clustered trees. And here are some examples here. And so the unclustering in black and white is at the bottom center, and, and then it's, uh, it's clustered in a colorful way by tree crown area on the right-hand side. Let's go to the next slide. So here are some results of when you machine process some of the data you see in the upper left-hand corner. We're making progress on mapping trees in a contiguous setting. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Now, associated to the Goddard Space Flight Center, there's an area of about 50 hectares which someone in NASA wanted to put up for auction, Goddard Space Flight Center is between Baltimore and Washington, D.C. So this would have been prime, prime development real estate. And then someone wanted to give it to one of the indigenous groups, and they would have made a casino out of it. There would be a giant parking lot. So a bunch of us intervened and said it should be given free of charge to the Patuxent Wildlife Refuge which is contiguous with this area on the north, uh, on the northern side. So uh, Ann Kent and I, uh, I'm with Katie Molosi, Katie Molosi, a person of my group, got busy and we uh, uh, clipped out this area. Uh, I think I don't know if we if we use Worldview three or Worldview two data, but we determined there were more than. 5,000 trees in the triangular area. And, and then using published uh, relationships uh, where you can incorporate tree, tree height, which we have from small footprint LIDAR, we were able to go to, to carbon for this area. And so uh, this is an example of the Eastern deciduous forest, contiguous trees. Uh, Tallest trees are greater than 30 meters tall. Average tree height in this area was 26 meters. Uh, and this supports restoration of the Chesapeake Bay. Next slide. So now you see all the tree crowns we mapped. There were more than 5,000 of them. Next slide. So we had small footprint LIDAR data, which enabled us to go to carbon using some relationships which Ralph Tobaya and his co-workers from the University of Maryland have developed. And so this is what we use to go from, from uh, a, on, a, on a tree crown by tree crown basis, using tree height to go to carbon for this area. And this would have been a major embarrassment if NASA was to sell this, and it would have been developed when it was adjacent to a very pristine wildlife refuge. Next slide. Okay, so we, we use satellite data to go to the number of the trees, and then we have small footprint LIDAR to go to carbon. And then on the bottom of this, you see a histogram from the small footprint LIDAR data. Um, so this is one example of what we're working towards for areas of contiguous trees. Next slide. Okay, so, so this is an example from the viewer. In our nature paper in the method section at the end, there is a viewer, and you go to it, this is what you see. So for this particular area, there are two images which were used, which I mentioned before. And then 
of the, of the trees, you'll, you can't see in the upper right, but on the upper left, there's a brighter green dot. That's that tree. And then you get at the bottom a zoom factor, of the latitude and longitude. And if you keep that URL, when, you, when you're in the viewer and you put that in, you'll go back exactly to the scene. So this is what we use to check things as proven and valuable. And it was developed by two members of our team to uh, enable our data to be useful. Next slide. So these are, are some of the people who worked on our first paper. And we really, I, I want to stress, we really had a lot of fun working on the proof of concept paper, uh, which we worked on for three or four years before we published it. Uh, so there's several people from the University of Copenhagen. So on, in the upper left-hand corner is then Kit Carreria, who's now at the University of Copenhagen Computer Science Department. Next to him on the right is, is Martin Brandt. It's a picture of me next to Martin Brandt from uh, 2024 expedition in the Amazon when we were with some indigenous people and they were using this, this tropical dye and so I dyed my white beard red. And then there are other people here. So uh, we had a very diverse group. And then last but not least, in the lower right-hand corner is Rasmus Fenholt from the University of Copenhagen. Now let's look at the next slide. Okay, well, okay. So let's go back to the people involved. And so this concludes the presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So what I tried to show is that we use uh, a large volume of commercial satellite data coupled to high performance computing and then uh, uh, machine learning with very accurate training data. I'll show tomorrow that we that we were astounded because we, we screened, three of us screened our data from the Nature paper of last year for clouds and aerosols, and we still mapped about 700 million trees in those areas. And, and then we investigated, and Martin Brandt had selected training data under high aerosol conditions, and also under high cirrus clouds, or sort of moderate cirrus clouds. Okay, so I'll stop here and be happy to answer any questions.